So this is a continuation of uh, me I'm reading Critical Consciousness Computing, the uh, online book by Amy J. Co. et al. And uh, this is me reading chapter four, CS, Equity and Justice. And I just wanted to share before I begin the fact that I am in this process of reading, engaging in this stage of deep learning. Uh, the stage of discovery. So going from uh, most likely I don't know that I didn't know to now I know that I didn't know. Although I will say because of my teaching experiences over the last six years, I think there are many things in this chapter that I do know, but um, for the sake of better understanding this model, this is the stage that I'll be in. And uh, again, for all who might be interested in teaching or learning CS, recognize that reading is probably one of the best gifts that you can do along that process because it allows you to tap into these other slices and not be um, at the mercy of uh, the lectures that you're enrolled in or um, the formal coursework that is presented in front of you. So let's get into it. Chapter four, CS equity and justice. Computing is much about prisons as it is profits. Image by Jesse Huin. Uh, this chapter is written by Amy J. Coe and Anne Baitlers. The key ideas from this chapter are, computing is not neutral. It is imbued with the values of its creators. Harm from data and algorithms stem partly from pre-existing systems of oppression in society at both the individual and structural levels. Data and algorithms can cause additional harm by amplifying, centralizing, privatizing, automating, and abstracting inequitable and unjust social systems. Teachers can build students' critical consciousness of computing, equity, and justice by linking the injustices in their lives to the technology in their lives. Those are the key ideas from chapter four. Here we go. Computer science as a discipline has often viewed software as neutral. Algorithms, many will argue, are neutral artifacts agnostic to the data they process. Data, many will say, are just ones and zeros, devoid of inherent meaning. These arguments, in a way, are similar to the arguments about other technologies that have potential for harm. For example, proponents of unrestricted gun rights will argue that guns don't kill people, people kill people absolving the weapon from any role in killing. Just a side note, Henry's thoughts. Guns breed more insecurity. They do not breed, they do not actually foster more security. Okay, back to it. Until the advent of the atomic bomb, many scientists viewed physics neutrally, seeing no particular role for scientists in how physics was applied. Many will use similar arguments about algorithms and data to claim that software, like guns and physics, is objective and impartial. Unlike people who may be racist, sexist, ableist, and more, some proponents of this neutral view of computing go further, celebrating code as a savior from humanity's inherent bias, finally freeing us from our discriminatory tendencies. This view of computing as neutral underlies the design of many computing most wondrous inventions. Artificial intelligence was pure scientific pursuit of enabling machines to think. The internet was designed to connect people for better or worse. Even the digital computer itself was born more from curiosities of theoretical mathematicians about what was possible than any particular political viewpoint. These intents, at least on the surface, seem pro-social and universal. But some see in these histories, however, value-laden decisions that were inherently inequitable and unjust. Artificial intelligence was never neutral. It was always about either replacing or augmenting people, which are decidedly industrialized visions of the future of society. The internet was never neutral. Its origins envisioned a future in which place and local community no longer mattered because everyone would be connected virtually. 
And the computer itself has always been a project of war and capitalism, including a tool for winning world wars, increasing profits in telecommunications, and accelerating business. And as numerous scholars and writers have shown, the code that underlies all computational systems is inseparable from the beliefs, values, and biases of these creators. Because people, and as we shall see with machine learning data created by people, ultimately determine the behavior of software. For example, software developers working as private contractors for the U.S. Transportation Security Agency, the TSA, decided that security scanners would discriminate against people with gender non-conforming bodies, subjecting them to invasive, humiliating pat-downs. Product managers and developers at Amazon decided to sell facial recognition software to police around the U.S., even though its accuracy was disproportionately low for black faces, the very faces being surveyed by police. The developers of countless websites have decided that the two letter last name of this book's first author is not a valid family name, preventing her from submitting web forms to access banking and social services. These anecdotes, demonstrate that code and data are far from value neutral. In fact, they are value and bias rich with every line of code and every bit of data making some judgment about who people are, how they behave and how society should work. Of course, this is true for many technologies, not just computing. People have worried about the potential harms of television, telephones, books, and even paper. The philosopher Plato, for example, wrote on the perils of writing, quote, if men learn this, it will implant forgetfulness in their souls. They will cease to exercise memory because they rely on that which is written, calling things to remembrance no longer from within themselves, but by means of external marks. Plato in his work of Phaedrus, P-H-A-E-D-R-U-S. There are reasons to believe that computing is no different from any of the technologies in history shaped by society and shaping society, but never ending society. After all, it took centuries before the printing press reshaped society, and we only had digital computers since the 1950s. But in many ways, software may be far more powerful than any technology in history. In this chapter, we will discuss the powerful forces behind computing that position it for harm and then discuss one possible method for teaching youth about those forces in ways that center their voices and experiences and develop their critical consciousness of computing. Here's another image by Jesse Green. Computing has a way of insisting on binaries, erasing the non-binary nature of human diversity. Computing and harm. There are many ways that computing can do harm. Software might do as little as annoy <clears throat> or frustrate someone in safety critical contexts, such as flight automation, healthcare, or driverless cars. It might do as much as kill someone. But the particular harms of concern in this book go beyond these individual experiences with computers to more collective concerns in society. We will discuss three types of harm and then examine the particular aspects of computing that often promote these harms. Equality, equity, and justice, subtitle. First are harms of inequality. One way of thinking about equality is in terms of resources and access to them. Equality from this perspective is the notion that everyone is given the same resources and access regarding, regardless of who they are. In computing, this might mean that software offers the same functionality and access to everyone. For example, consider an English-only COVID-19 testing website designed for people in the local community to find the nearest testing sites. For such a website to treat everyone the same, it doesn't have to do much. As long as the website does not discriminate on the basis of who someone is, then it is treating everyone equally. Of course, what does equal really mean? If someone cannot read English, how is it treating them the same as someone who can? If someone does not have internet access and cannot access the service, how is it treating them the same as someone who does? And in recommending testing sites, if it only considers physical distance to testing sites, but not 
transportation options? Would it be treating people with a car? Wouldn't would not would not it be treating people with a car, people reliant on public transportation and people without access to either differently? Equality in this case results in inequity, a difference in outcomes of a software design choice, even in the presence of equal treatment. To achieve equity, the website must need to be translated into many different languages, offer more precise data on how long it would take to transit to a testing site, and even offer data on the cost of transportation and tests to help people make informed decisions about where to get tested. An even more inequitable solution might couple the website with transportation services to help individuals and their families get to testing sites free of charge so that money doesn't become a barrier to public health, or even better yet, services that involve public health staff coming to someone's home to administer a test. But even equity has its limits. In the more equitable version above, for example, why is it even necessary for individuals to have to find testing sites using a website or any other means? Or why are they even sick? These are the questions of justice, which engage what rights to fairness people deserve and what we owe to each other. One might argue, for example, there that a more just approach to COVID-19 would be for there to be a dense and robust network of community public health centers in every neighborhood in every country. If every person got their health care from such centers and such health care was free, there would be no questions about where to get tested or how much it would cost and no need for a website for finding testing sites. Instead, software might be used to enable public health and health care providers to focus on prevention and mobilize rapid responses to future pandemics, all built on the foundation of mutual trusting local relationships. Software can be used to create more socially just worlds. It is just more often used for profit, power, and oppression. Subtitle, How Computing Does Harm. There are many reasons why computing may have tendencies toward peril and oppression. Some of them are similar to that of those of any technology. In an unjust, oppressive world, technology is bound to, use, to be used for unjust, mm -hmm. oppressive ends. However, there are specific aspects of data and algorithms that seem to make computing un uniquely perilous, especially when they interact with underlying systems of oppression in society. One aspect is computing is its ability to amplify existing sources of harm. Amplification is the idea that potential harm already exists in society and is caused by people making harmful choices, often unknowingly, but technology is often harnessed to spread that harm further than one person might achieve on their own. For example, let's return to the TSA scanner example mentioned above. If security checks were done entirely by human TSA agents, gender non-conforming travelers or travelers with non-normative physical disabilities might only occasionally face harassment by some TSA agents, but not others. The harm in this case would be limited to whatever beliefs an individual TSA agent has about trans and non-binary people. However, when the TSA commissioned machine learning based body scanners and created software that enabled it, a binary notion of what a normal male body and a normal female body look like, it shifted responsibility of judging human bodies from the diverse individual beliefs of TSA agents to a uniform standard encoded into a machine by an unrepresented sensitive data set of human bodies. And in the sentence, normal was in quotes and still is in quotes. <laughs> no longer was harm to gender non-conforming travelers limited to the most transphobic TSA agents, but it was now universal to interactions with every TSA agent. Applications of code and data to society therefore built upon an underlying basis in society and through the speed, precision, and reliability of code scaled out bias in ways that no technology prior has ever done. Whereas amplification is about how code encodes in equalities, inequities, and injustices as data and algorithmic rules, and rapidly spreads it, 
centralization concerns the way that code reduces flexibility in how rules in society are interpreted. For example, let's return to our TSA example. Prior to automated body scanners, each TSA agent dealt with a diversity of gender non-conforming or disabled bodies in different ways. Some might notice that someone was disabled and decide they were not a threat. Others might decide to gather more information before deciding that they were a threat. And others still, biased by ableism, might assume they were a threat. This diversity of reasoning allowed for its own kind of harm. But in creating TSA scanner algorithms, the software developers writing those algorithms could only choose one set of rules by which it, to judge the threat that someone posed. And they chose rules that define normal able bodies, normal female bodies, and then flagged anyone that deviated from normal as needing an invasive search. Normal again was in quotes in that sentence. Centralization in this case eliminated the potential for TSA agents to have different ways of assessing the threat posed by people with disabilities or gender non-conforming bodies, only allowing a single set of rules that did not account for this diversity. One could argue that there are such things as normal bodies, putting aside the fact that every human body is different, whether gender non-conforming or not. But even if this were true, centralization of the rules means that no one can apply different rules. But the TSA agents or the people going through security, centralization, therefore, is a way of taking what was previously a power distributed across all of the stakeholders in the social context and sent concentrating it in an algorithm written and maintained by nameless, faceless software developers who aren't in that social situation and may never be. If those developers make fair and just choices, then centralization can help achieve justice at greater scale. But more often, those choices are not just and centralization makes change harder. A third source of harm in computing is privatization. This is the tendency for algorithms and data to be private goods rather than public ones. One can imagine, for example, that the TSA algorithms and data that define normal could be a subject could be subject to public debate, allowing for democratic processes to make them more inclusive and even advocate for abandoning the algorithm in favor of more equitable human screening processes. But the algor but algorithms and data, when they are built in for-profit settings by private businesses are not public. The TSA, for example, was created after the 9-11 tax in 2001 as part of the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, which is overseen by the executive branch of the United States. Changing TSA policies, therefore, requires changing democratically elected representatives, such as the U.S. President and members of the U.S. Congress, who can create laws and orders that change the TSA's practices. These democratic institutions, while complex, are a viable path to justice. But how does one change the source code of the TSA body scanners? The scanner hardware and software is owned and built by RASP, RAPI Scan Systems, a private company in California, which has no legal responsibility to make its source code available for audit and no democratic responsibility to the United States or any other country to respond to demands for change. Moreover, because it has a monopoly over scanning technology used by the TSA, it has no incentives to change its source code. Even if TSA wants it to, they can just decline and TSA and the government will have no recourse but to abandon its contract, halting security screening at airports. Privatization therefore shifts power away from the democratic processes to a small number of software designers and developers and private companies. A fourth source of harm is automation. Whereas amplification concerns the way that the speed of computing increases the scale of its impact, centralization concerns the lack of flexibility and how algorithms follow rules and privatization concerns who decides the rules. Automation is the economic force that replaces human work with algorithms to increase productivity. Of course, automation has long been an economic force, even before computing. Instead of walking, we take public transit or drive cars, and instead of hand weaving, we invented looms. Today, however, 
most automation in the world is driven by algorithms. Continuing our TSA example, it is possible and has already happened in many countries that TSA agents will be replaced entirely by automated scanners. As there is less human judgment to oversee and override the injustices of algorithms, all of the other forces become stronger. Privatization becomes an even bigger barrier to change. Centralization puts even more importance on the source code and amplification happens to an even greater degree. This might look like a scanner, preventing anyone who does not have a normal body as defined by a scanner from ever flying on the plane. The more we eliminate human intelligence, judgment, and expertise from our social contexts, the more power is given to code and the people who write it. A fifth force of computing that produces harm is of abstraction. This key idea in computing, which we will return to many times in this book, is the idea of taking complex phenomena in the world and eliminating nuance from it to try to capture its essence. Humanity does this in many media. Every word in natural language, for example, is an abstraction, which tries to capture the essence of an idea. The word duck doesn't merely capture the full complexity of a real duck, but it does still usefully represent our shared concept of a duck. <laughs> Mathematics also uses abstraction, reducing the complexity of an idea like a child to purely symbolic terms like one. Computing like language and math uses abstraction, but goes beyond language and mathematics, defining abstract representations of real world phenomena that only model reality in abstract terms, but embed these models and social processes in the world. These abstractions come to define reality, enabling centralization, amplification, privatization, and automation. For example, the TSA body scanner algorithms can only work if it has an abstract idea of what a normal human body is. The essence of its algorithm is to detect and flag a flag for a normalist, a no, a normalist bodies for further inspection because an anomaly, anomaly is that anomaly might be a weapon, but. The scanner cannot reasonably account for every single unique detail of each human body on the planet and how it is changing. Instead, the scanner's reason about an abstraction of human bodies defined by a data set that tries and fails to represent the diversity of human bodies. And that abstraction, rather than the actual reality of human bodily diversity, is used to decide who gets an invasive body inspection. The only way to avoid the harm of abstractions is either to find abstractions that limit harm. For example, giving the TSA scanner a more diverse data set that fully captures our variations or not use computers at all, which might be fine. TSA agents could just assess each individual as a unique person. Abstraction, therefore, is necessary for computing to work, and yet abstraction necessarily stereotypes and erases by ignoring detail, context, exceptions, nuance, and diversity. None of these mechanisms of harm necessitate that computing is harmful. Perhaps the TSA body scanners do some good, possibly helping prevent terrorism, streamlining lines, sparing travelers with, quote, normal bodies, from an invasive pat down. Moreover, some TSA agents may be quite biased in other ways. For example, racially profiling people of color by empowering the TSA scanners and their algorithms to determine threats, perhaps some forms of bias are avoided. Designing computing to all to avoid bias is therefore not a simple matter of not using computing at all though that should always be an option, but rather carefully designing computing with rich awareness of human diversity so that people already marginalized by society aren't further marginalized by these computational forces. And better yet, it might mean designing computing that helps resist and dismantle the systems of oppression already in society. 
For example, rather than creating more software to police travelers at airports, we might create software that helps address the underlying causes of terrorism at airports, furthering dialogue, diplomacy, and mutual understanding of diverse cultures globally. Such efforts would focus computing on creating a more just world rather than one that is merely equal or even equitable. Here's another image by Jesse. Queen, conversations about diversity require time and reflection. There's um, a set of hands. And in the center, there's orange specks. Subtitle, Teaching CS, Equity and Justice. Harm from computing is not inevitable. Ensuring that everyone learns how computing can do harm can ensure that we are all mindful advocates against these harms. Whether citizens voting on the policy that regulates technology or software developers and designers making choices about how software will behave. But helping youth understand the sources of harm from data and algorithms requires more than just explaining these harms. New software is being created every day and so youth need the skills to examine, imagine, and reason about the new computing systems that will inevitably enter their lives, posing new challenges to equality, equity, and justice. Subtitle, Research on Teaching CS Ethics. Most efforts to educate youth about computing in the intersection of equality, equity, and justice to date have occurred in post-secondary education and have often been described as ethics courses. For decades, many CS departments at universities offered and only sometimes required these ethic, ethics courses, but such courses were often taught by faculty without any expertise in ethics or social justice. And because they were separate from the rest of the technical curriculum and drew upon social science traditions instead of science and engineering traditions, students often viewed them as irrelevant to CS and their future careers as software developers. With the rise in visibility of ethical crises in the software industry, many in higher education have turned their attention to teaching some ethics more intentionally. For example, one survey of CS courses found that many CS departments have begun to innovate in CS, CS ethics curriculum, some deepening standalone courses, others integrating ethics across curriculum, but still narrowly focusing on issues of bias and fairness, while ignoring broader human, social, and societal factors, as well as issues of what responsibility professional software developers have to make ethical choices. More recent efforts have tried to overcome this narrow focus in several ways. One, some have situated technical CS concepts in the real world ethical dilemmas in ways that do not detract from technical learning. Two, some have positioned students as designers responsible for taking perspectives of multiple stakeholders in real and narrative design contexts, but have found that even such situated learning does not necessarily transfer to everyday design decisions. Three, some have partnered with experts in political science, critical media theory, and science and technology studies to provide broader and deeper exposure to how computing intersects with issues of equality, equity, and justice. While these innovations and post-secondary methods offer some guidance to secondary, they do all tend to make one major assumption that students have an established interest in CS and an aspiration to be a software developer or technical decision maker, directly influencing the impact of computing on society. In secondary classrooms, this is not a reasonable assumption. Students may have no interest in CS and no aspiration to be a software developer, but may nevertheless care about the impact of CS on their lives. Moreover, all students should have some capacity to reason about the role of computing in their lives in society, regardless of what roles they play in society in their lives, not only because nearly every profession interacts with computing in some way, but because computing also has indirect impacts on everyone. As we discussed earlier, Research in secondary context is only just beginning to examine how to engage critical questions about computing for these broader audiences. Following the critical CS pedagogies we discussed in previous chapters, we know that 
talking about equity and justice can pose some unique pedagogical challenges. First, talking about justice in the context of computing necessarily may require engaging in highly charged topics at the center of social and political conflict. Therefore, a central challenge in teaching about these topics is identifying familiar injustices that a diversity of students can recognize, understand, and accept as injustice so they can do the hard work of analyzing the role of computing in that injustice. Doing this successfully means engaging richly with the injustices that might already be talked about in history, English, or social studies classes, or that students might be fam familiar with in their daily lives. For example, while many students have never encountered a TSA body scanner, they might have daily experiences with misinformation on Instagram, barriers paying with cash on public transport, transit, or the unpredictable schedules that algorithms are assigning to their parent and guardian's shift work. Another challenge with engaging in justice are the difficult conversations that such subjects may provoke. Some students may refuse to accept the existence of injustice or insist on the objectivity of particular abstractions in the world, for example, binary notions of gender. Promoting critical consciousness about computing therefore requires preparing students for the possibility of that conflict, having norms on how to handle it, and setting clear expectations that in the short time of a classroom period or even a whole unit, disagreements might not be resolved. That is not to say that teachers should avoid these controversies, but it does suggest that choosing topics carefully can help balance the goal of developing critical consciousness of computing and the risk of destabilizing social classroom conflict. Here's an image of uh, the caption, schools are the site of algorithmic oppression too. In the center of the photo, uh, there's a student with his head down on his desk, sitting down in the tension um, is a label behind him. There's a clock and it seems Perhaps the teacher is fading and walking away. Uh, the walls are vanilla in color and the ground is orange. Images by Jesse. Subtitle, unit sketch, schools as a site for CS inequity and injustice. Here we present one possible unit sketch that builds upon these ideas. This sketch is not complete, perfect, or final, but rather a sketch that might inspire your own instructional designs and unit plans. The essence of this example unit is to engage students in interrogating the algorithms or hypothetical, hypothetical algorithms in your school and how they might result in desperate outcomes for different students. Rules in schools might include things like use of the bathroom, tardiness, grading systems, or policies for late work. The advantage of classroom school rules are that they are familiar and may surface inequities in learning that contribute to broader inequities in society. One possible disadvantage, especially if the rules interrogated are the ones in your own classroom, is that the unit might result in actual advocacy for change, though any teacher focused on critical consciousness might want to view this as an advantage as well. The learning objectives of this unit sketch are as follows. One, student will be able to recognize the rules and social systems, including the rules that are encoded in al as algorithms. Two, students will be able to analyze how encoding rules as code might result in harmful amplification, centralization, privatization, automation, or abstraction. Three, students will be able to explain how encoding rules as code relies on abstraction. Four, students will be able to apply these skills to the software in their lives. And this unit has split across five sessions, the first presenting the idea of rules and subsequent sessions engaging students and identifying the rules that govern the social context of their classroom and school. Algorithms come halfway through as a tool for potentially automating school rules, engaging youth to analyze the potential disparate impact of that automation in their classes. I'm gonna end here for now. Um, 
and I'm losing my voice, <laughs> as you might have noticed. Okay, see you next time.